tuned in. Free Smoke the podcast. Sitting here, Adam Twenty Two. So ah. big. This is a big moment for me. You know, you're like the reason why I started doing this podcast shit. Nice. Which is like, it's surreal to just be able to live in LA. I look at like my first podcast, like four years ago in Sacramento. I was watching all your shit, and I was just like, this dude is sick. He's coming through with some raw, you know, raw shit with these rappers these people that i fuck with it wasn't even rappers it was mm. just like all types of creators you know i will say that's one cool thing is that as time has gone by it's like more and more when i see people and they want to talk to me about me influencing them or whatever it's kind of like bro you're the og like it's like a lot of people see me as somebody who figured out a lot of what's going on in content right now kind of early which is a really good feeling so i'm glad that i could help inspire you in your younger days no, you still inspired me today, bro. That's why I'm just like, I appreciate you pulling up. My appreciate pleasure. you coming through. Like, without without you, this wouldn't really have been possible, you know? Hey, or it might have might have just been a little harder, <laughs> you know? Hey, much but, respect. But shit, man, prepping for this shit, I was just like, man, he's just kind of been hoed out on, like, all these interviews. <laughs> you know, he kind of just getting gangbanged. Yeah. Just so many, uh, so many interviews out here with Adam22. A lot of truth to that. Yeah. Why is that? I mean, I'll just do people's interviews, you know, like from time to time. I mean, I try not to do like too many. But, like sometimes somebody will just bug me a bunch and I'll just do theirs or whatever. But it is weird when you think about it because if you're like a real superstar, I mean, if you're really in demand, you don't have to go do a bunch of podcasts. But, I mean, I like doing it. And it's like it's always interesting to see people's setups and everything. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Oh, well, my thing is, like, you kind of do it every week having your own podcast. You know, you kind of people people find out about you. People figure you out, you know, yeah. find out random facts about you. Like, I, I think if you're a podcaster, there's it's not like there's a bad connotation or there's not a bad circumstance where you're just doing too many interviews, putting yourself out there because you have to put yourself out there to be a fucking podcaster. Right. Like, it's not like it's the weekend and you have some mystique like you can't yeah. can't have can't be a podcaster and have mystique but i think about somebody like academics who i mean he's done shit with me but you can imagine he's been asked a million times to do people's podcasts and then he finally did vlad and you know that's like it kind of stands out because he didn't do a bunch of podcasts leading up to that sometimes i look at my shit and i'm like damn you done every fucking podcast like maybe it would have been kind of beneficial for you to be more rare with it you know drake drake will do one interview for me i'm going to new york in a couple of weeks i'm going to do like eight interviews you know just fuck with a bunch of people it's different different style yeah i feel like this post-covid run was just like uh, everyone was just so eager to just get content after everything opened up you know mm. a lot of people were camped out plotting on content during Plus, COVID. Also, <laughs> also like the way i looked at it too i was like adam probably does these podcasts with all these other people because maybe he's been there when he didn't, wasn't trying to get it. like like when no one was watching his shit or when no one was fucking with him and he just wanted that big look right or that look of just like damn fuck with me you know yeah no i definitely look at all the people who let me interview them early on just like damn like that was fucking huge at the time i feel that way still like we we spoiler for the people out there we just went to vegas we went friday morning to saturday morning just to pull up on Dan Bilzerian and interview him. And it's like, when I was thinking about it when I got home, I was like, you know, like, because for some reason I searched after they did the interview, I searched Dan Bilzerian interview on YouTube and I was looking at it. And he might only have like four or five kind of over the years. Like, it's not that many. But then I was kind of thinking, like, damn, like, you really went just to Ve all the way to Vegas just to interview somebody who already done like a bunch of interviews. And then I caught myself and I was like, bro. This was the whole point. Like, fuck, fuck if other people had already done it or whatever. Like, just just to do your version of interviewing somebody. Like, you can't look at it like, oh, I'm, I'm interviewing this guy like four years after Rogan interviewed him, or I'm interviewing him after, you know, he just did Logan Paul or whatever the fuck it is. Like, you, like I don't know. I always just you have to believe in order to be a podcaster, you have to kind of have enough of an ego to believe that you're bringing something special to the table, whether that is bullshit or not. Yeah, because, I mean, the game nowadays, everyone's trying to be a podcaster and be an mm -hmm. interviewer, and it's like, how many times are you going to ask someone about their childhood or where they grew up? But sometimes you know? I build it up in my head too much where it's like, 
you know like i want to i want to be bringing something special to the table every time and i'll be looking at somebody and i'll be like damn like they're dope but they just did vlad six months ago so i don't want to interview him you know like if i feel like i'm not going to be able to bring something different to it like i don't i don't like just like redoing the interviews other people have already done i'm always trying to think what what can i do about this interview that's going to make it special I, I know because I was I was feeling like this getting ready for this one. That's why I was yep. like, "Fuck!" A challenge, you know, <laughs> it's definitely a challenge. You feel like podcasting got easier or harder nowadays? Like, I mean, you're more established, but like, with all this competition, is it easier to stick out? I mean, definitely easier for me physically because I've just done it so many times that it's like I'm rarely thrown a curveball. I feel like I kind of know what I'm going for or getting into now. But definitely, yeah, like competing is tough. You know, like bringing something different to the table can definitely be tough i'm always just trying to spot like good openings you know like i just did cowboy from 60s and i just felt like that was such a fucking amazing interview that was one where i was like i can't believe that you know nipsey's been dead for like three four years and nobody ever got a cowboy interview when he's so clearly somebody who had a front seat perspective on nipsey's whole career so like that you know if, if i had done that interview and he had already done gangster chronicles and vlad and some other podcast and i was like the fourth one to do an interview with him it would be a lot harder for me to get ready because i would have to really believe that i was bringing something new to the table like i, I you know it's some there's just so many podcasters out there that's like just i want to bring something new to it i want a diehard fan of theirs to be able to look at this guy in a new light because i want to bring it to the table that is kind of a high bar to hold yourself to but it's at least something to aspire to. I mean, yeah, like, especially with nowadays, you know, it, like I said, everyone's trying to do this shit. Yeah. I would think when you first started this shit, it was it was hard to get access to people. And maybe, like, on the technical side, it was hard to build this shit. It's kind of hard to even convince people, like, oh, you should sit down for an hour. Like, an hour. Right. You know? Like, that seemed like a really long interview, you know? Like, that was much. People thought you were going to edit it down. <laughs> or whatever like in the beginning like, I just remember a lot of rap type people being a, kind of surprised and like confused also we were downtown and like there were like rats and bums outside that's that's funny you bring that up because I, I've I filmed a podcast for someone else here at the studio and it was like an hour 30 and they're like yo can you trim it to an hour and I was just I was trying to convince him like that's not I, I don't think you should do that like you should just let it run and he's like no man content over an hour people don't want to watch that there is truth to that. Like, I've heard uh, Graham Stephan, who does, like, this really big business podcast I went and did recently, he said that, like, if he has, like, a 20-minute video, he'll go crazy editing it to bring it to, like, 1959. Or if it's, mm. like, an hour and 10 minutes or whatever, he'll go crazy trying to take an hour out of it. Which, to me, like, that probably makes sense, like, if your goal is to maximize views – but I'm not doing anything to just, like, maximize views. Like, I just feel like the content is the content. You know, and a lot of my biggest successes, whether it's fucking 1090 Jake for three and a half hours or Snow Billy for three hours or Ben Baller for, like, three or four hours or whatever the fuck, like, a lot of my biggest interviews are just ones that are, like, really kind of bizarrely long. Like, people see a long, a long number there and they just assume it's going to be dope because why the fuck else would you go that long? Yeah, right. You know? like, I mean, that's what I was just like. I think I would think it would help run up your views. You know, even if you don't watch it in one sitting, you come back, you watch it again. You know, people. But I get it because when I see that Logan Paul interviewed somebody and it's 45 minutes, I'm like, hmm, maybe I can do that. If I see Logan Paul interview someone and it's two hours and 45 minutes, I'm, there's a much bigger chance that my brain is going to be like, nah, too long. But that's me as a casual Logan Paul viewer. I'm kind of like doing it for a hardcore viewer who's down to ride out for three hours with me you know and if they're not down if they're gonna just check some clips on the clips channel okay so be it if they're gonna look at the timestamps and be like oh i'm gonna skip to this this and this okay so be it we try to make that easy on people you know i mean i just feel like we're getting into a an age and time where our attention span is just getting shorter and shorter and shorter so it's like it's funny everyone wants to do these podcasts but really it's like we're just consu we we have the attention span to consume like two minutes type shit, and then it's it's we want to see something else. Yeah. But why for why for, why is it for podcasts? We're down to just sit yeah. like a movie too, you know. But now by default, it's like if you're going to do a podcast, you got to cut it down for TikTok. You got you know like right. that's just everybody who has a podcast. That's one of the first questions is like, oh, I need a TikTok editor, you know. Which hey, go get them. Like I mean, that is the way to think of it. 
is like I'm going to do an hour long piece of content and I'm going to get a couple of one minute chunks that you know because like there's just so many more people that will watch a one minute interview clip with me or whoever than will watch a full two hour thing you know yeah I feel like you could you could stretch out the product a lot more nowadays yeah you know back in the day it was just all right you just post the podcast what do you make clips dude I think about that a lot like all like like what if we had the clips channel when I interviewed X and there was a clip called XXX Tentacion talks about beating the dog shit out of his fucking gay cellmate in prison or like you know like if I that would have been an accurate title I was like one of the clips that like got him in so much fucking hot water because people are so mad about that but like yeah when I started though I really like I believed that this mission was so pure that I'm just gonna do these pieces drop it I'm not doing a title I'm not doing clips it's really hard to stand out you know all my early interviews are like Ian Connor and Shane Gonzalez interview. It's not no, I Ian Connor talks about this. Ian Connor pulls out a strap. I remember. Yeah, I you mean know? it's it's weird how the title has evolved in YouTube. It's you know? tough. But if you look at somebody like Joe Rogan, before he left YouTube, his titles were always it's not it's gonna be Joe Rogan Experience number four thousand seven hundred and ninety three with Adam twenty two. It's not Adam twenty two talks about fighting a bum. <laughs> You know, it's like you, you, it, it is on you. I just know I'm going to get way more views if I title it good. So I, I got to title it good, you know. But you had to make that adjustment too. You had to realize, like, damn, do you accredit anyone to. I mean, Vlad's like, the OG. That's just what like I, I, titling I shit accurately. Yeah, I think of Vlad. Know? He was, he's the OG. He was the first one through the wall. So he got all the shit for it. The same way the academics was the first hood reporter. And he got so much shit for it, which opened the door. For somebody like me or 16 or Flacco or whoever to get way less shit. AD's Clips Channel? AD's Clips Channel. Now a gangster <laughs> like AD from the mean streets of Compton is thinking in clickbait, which is kind of crazy because that just was not the way it worked. Well, I'm sure that that clickbait title like way of doing it probably brings a lot of bullshit too because you know you probably got people's feelings getting hurt and they're like what the fuck you're trying to manip- yeah. like manipulate this you know like i feel like it brings more room for a conflict even with your friends right lazi hit me the other day hey why are you upload that or, he, he didn't trip about it but he was like can you take down the clip of me talking about the dui you know he regretted it i'm like i guess when i cut that clip i i could have guessed that like that he was probably going to feel that way. But my attitude is always like, you talk about it on the podcast. If it's if it's accurate, I'm going to put a clip. Because if if you didn't want the clip, then why are you talking about it, right? Is it hard to maintain that uh, those principles sometimes, you know, like or that, that standard? Because, I mean, kind I'm of. sure, like, how often do you get asked for shit to be taken down? Usually I'll do it. Like, you know, Mark from fucking Software Underbelly was like, please take down that clip because I titled it like, Mark from Software Underbelly talks about falling in love with one of his guests. And, like, it's like Did a picture of, like, the Software Underbelly set with, like, it's like a silhouette with a question mark. And he, like, you know, he doesn't do that with his content. He'll write, Bernice, escort, boom. Even that, even just put in the title for what they're doing is kind of, like, a thing. It's a little salacious, you know, it's, it's on the spectrum. But I took it down because I'm like, whatever, bro. If you don't, if you're unhappy about this existing that much, then okay fine but like i don't know sometimes people want the clip taken down when it's like bro like are you serious that's the whole th- that's the most interesting thing that's the only interesting thing in the fucking interview and you're gonna tell me that i can't even title it that way come on see back in the day when you were just titling it their their name they probably didn't give a fuck that's cr- but i you still know? have people ask me to take their shit down back then oh okay you know yeah i just feel like right now it's, we're in this space where it's like everyone's kind of just seeing how far they can they can get away with shit or how you know like there's not really rules in this shit because everyone's doing it now you know so it's like think of it like kind of you have to have the clickbait title but you also have to hold some sort of standards of what's going on you know Mm -hmm. like you can't totally violate them like the title of ad talks about kendrick lamar confronting him back in the day i had to think about that for like 10 minutes because the first version of in my head was like AD on Kendrick Lamar almost beating him up back in the day. <laughs> and I'm like, AD's going to be pissed because it's not like he like really came that close to beating him up or like, you know, like it's just like 
but confronting. I mean, you can't deny that he confronted him. He pulled up on him and said, like, who are you? Where are you from? Whatever the fuck it was. You know, so I was like, but that's a, the real challenge is, like, fitting it into that tiny little title box, you know? Like, I remember back in the day, there used to be a, a dude that I would talk to who was, like, an English teacher, and we were all in this, like, group chat or whatever, and sometimes when the homie would be writing a blog post, they would send it to him to condense it. Like, yo, can you make this 15 characters shorter and he would send back some brilliant way of like condensing it all into like a title you know like that's such a, a skill with youtube it's well, like headline writing because you can only fit so many nouns in there that's what i'm saying like you have 200 characters on a youtube title like it's definitely a art to it you have to learn it. you got to be smart you could put words in the title though words in the title or, or in the thumbnail in the th- okay. because like the ralphie the plug vlog thumbnail the other day i wrote this rapper has beef with me because I felt like it was going to like like Ralphie the Plug has beef with me was like too much for the title, you know? And so sometimes I put Ralphie the Plug wants smoke in the title so I didn't have to use his name or not in the title, but in the thumbnail so I didn't have to use it in the title. Do you feel like you're constantly experimenting or you kind of get the gist of this shit now? This is a constant challenge. And sometimes I'll see people title something where I could have titled my interview clip that way and I'll be like, Fuck. The one thing I haven't found is somebody who I can, like, hire and add to the team who, like, knows how to title shit better than me. That's what mm-hmm. I really need. And it's, like, I think my mind is totally skewed in favor of myself because I just – if I've titled something shitty, then I can blame myself. I can accept that. But it's, like, I don't know. I just – it would be really hard. I really need to, like, work at it because that would be the biggest time saver I could get is a person to help me with titles. Yeah, I was going to ask, like, what's what's more – strenuous on the mind like prepping for the interview or figuring out a fucking title a lot of the interviews i do is like almost no prep time you know Mm. like the other day we did fucking rico strong and richie the barber it's like they haven't i I guess rico did interviews back in the day richie's done a little bit but it's like i like search a name on youtube and like a lot of times i won't even watch the clips that i'm gonna ask about i just like think like oh that's a good thing to ask him about i don't know i'm not watching the clip i'm just gonna ask him about that you know mm. so it's like then sometimes you interview somebody who's got like five classic albums and you feel like i don't want him to mention something about a song that was on album number three that i'm not gonna remember and it was such an important song in his career some artists really want to test you yeah. make sure you know about them you know it's kind of all over i mean that's probably awkward if you get if you get tested and you don't really know i mean when we were in o block some of fucking those dudes were like you know my name What's my name? Like, they're they're testing me. Like, are you a real O Block fan? Yeah. And some of them I realized afterwards, like, fuck, I should have really known that guy's name. He was like around Vaughn like the whole time. Or he has songs or whatever, you know. So, if I went back to O Block, I'll probably be armed with more knowledge. Man, the titles, titles is just a crazy thing, man. I feel like it's just been exploding lately. That's one thing I learned too. I, I would just try to title my shit regular. Just the subject, who it is. I mean, I got used to it with the vlogs. Because mm-hmm. vlogs are the number one thing. That if you title it what you actually did, it ain't going to, you know. How's how's daily vlogging been? I enjoy it. it. It lets me, like, have a nice perspective on my life. Yeah. And it makes me feel like the old days. And I watched some old vlogs, and that's what fully motivated me to do it again. Because I just saw this, like, younger version of myself where vlogging was super easy because I just wanted to, like, make something out of myself in this space, you know. And it was just, like, documenting me doing it day by day. And I was just so free with just talking about my shit into the camera. Like, I don't know. Then I got spoiled with it for a while at the store because it's, like, I didn't have to do that because it's, like, all these weird people coming in every day, interviews, random people giving me shit. It just became so easy. And then my standard for what a vlog was kind of changed. And it kind of became, like, I don't know. But now I'm just trying to make it more about me, you know, my journey. It's, like, because I feel like is it is it – Oh, actually, going back to the you prepping for an interview, you say you don't like really write notes and shit. Is that because you're seasoned shit, now? Sometimes. Is, uh, is it or what has it always been like that? Like, it's like Wayne in the studio. Has he always been freestyling, or you know he just was writing first and then he got good at it, then he started freestyling type shit? Yeah, no, like for sure, I don't, I don't research anywhere near as much as I used to because mm-hmm. I used to be super nervous, and to me, like getting ready for the interview is like the cure for your anxiety i told my girl because my girl just started doing the podcast i'm like two things at the same time you should 
prepare the fuck out of yourself and have a bunch of questions in case you find yourself in a dead end. But then you should also remember that probably the best interview that you could do is just you guys having the same fucking conversation that you would have off camera, mm. you know? You had to learn that? Yeah, I was super... I had a lot of anxiety about doing interviews at first, especially. I would be interviewing some random BMX dude that I, like, knew very well, and I would be nervous as fuck, like, in Same. the lead-up. I still know? get nervous. This I was this I was nervous for this one. Yeah. Um, but but I've, I've watched some of your old ones, mm -hmm. and you, it, you just... You hear a different tone, a different tempo, a different pacing. I was really, like, anxious, so I was really, like uppity and if they gave me like a kind of short answer i would jump i would jump down their throat and start asking the next question or whatever it's like it's better to let it breathe now when i'm going to do an interview the thing like if i am nervous which doesn't happen that much but the number one thing i always try to keep in mind is like just chill just relax slow it down like you're the num the only thing you can control is like how you feel and the vibe that you're bringing to it so that's why I, I smoke weed during the day and I'm just chilling because I, I try to make it as natural as possible. I try to make it as close to me sitting down and just doing a meeting with that person, just doing lunch with that person for an hour. Try well, to kind of make it like that, you know? I definitely, I definitely feel you because I'm in that space right now where I'm trying to get over the anxiety type shit. Mm. Like when you were first were doing it, was it kind of hard to like make that adjustment? Or, like, did you watch your shit back and kind of just be like, damn, this shit, you know? I think I just gradually got more and more used to it, you know? And, like, I just, I, I do a lot of times have a bunch of notes ready, you know? I just have a bunch of things written down, like, especially if there's important topics that I really want to go for. It's interesting, though, because now I have, like, T-Rail kind of, like, asking for advice because I see him going through some of the shit that I went through early on where he'll do an interview with somebody and they'll just not, they'll give him an answer that is just, like, nothing and then he's just like what the fuck like how am i gonna do an interview with you if you're gonna give me that bullshit but i heard him i was watching one of his interviews and he's like so what was life like growing up for you and they just breezed through their whole you know when they do that and they're like man i grew up in this neighborhood started trapping turned that into rapping and now here i am <laughs> <laughs> and T. was just like, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. You got to wind that shit back. You better slow it the fuck down. And I'm like, that's dope that he already knows that that kind of answer is a fucking no-go for an interview because, you know, the whole point of an interview is to go into depth. If you're trying to do an hour-long interview, you got to slow it the fuck down and go into detail about some shit, right? No, I agree. Mm. It's easy, though. It's easy just to breeze past shit. I mean, you bring up that point of, like, asking about you know your childhood or your growing up what was it like like there's some sort of formula to this interview shit mm. would you agree like you start in chronological order i always try to do that i think that's like my style is that i do want to provide like a comprehensive look at your career or whatever um if i feel like that's already kind of been covered like i had this dude larry this bank robber on uh the other day larry lawton and uh he had already done like such a breakdown of his life on vlad that I tried to like avoid that and just really have like a chill conversation talking about a bunch of random stuff. And I tried to do less of the like, okay, and so then you did this. All right, so now tell me about doing this because it, I felt like it was already done kind of recently and I want to do something more unique. But yeah, I usually try to like kind of document their life. Like when I was doing Rico Strong the other day with Flocka, <laughs> we're kind of like just fucking around in the beginning and then Flocka was like, so, so let me ask you this, like, you know, piping chicks you got a big ass dick right, right he like jumps right into like his life right now or like you know some some real porn shit and i'm like no 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 this interview is gonna be a fucking mess if i don't like talk about his early <laughs> days because clearly i wanted to talk about him coming up in long beach him being a crip how how do you get into porn like go, you i know you went to jail or whatever you beat a case like we gotta do all that like just because in my head it's like we gotta cover that early on yeah. It's going to be weird as fuck if I have to ask you those questions once you've already told me about fully being a porn star. Yeah, like you know? dick size questions, literally, you got to wait like 30 minutes for that at least. You yeah, know? That, I, I can't ask you that until we've already established how you got here. Exactly. You know? I, I enjoy his enthusiasm though, Flacco. Yeah, me too. Flacco is a... Uh, Flacco's interesting. I wanted to ask you about him. I realize I need to have a sign. I need to be able to poke him in the leg to let him know that I'm about to end the interview. Because sometimes I'll be trying to end it, and then he'll just be, like, asking a bunch more questions. And they're good questions and shit, but, like, you know, in my head, the the interview has a pace. Once we've done enough, 
then I could start to like wind it down, you know. But yeah, he's somebody I just saw on YouTube. He DM'd me, thought he was talented, and figured let's get him out here. And honestly, like even though a lot of people were talking shit about him at first, I could tell. I could tell that they were warming up to him bit by bit. And even now, we'll have him on an interview, and there'll be some people talking shit, but it'll be way less than in the beginning. But I saw that same thing with AD and you know other people to maybe a lesser extent where like you know if they're not they weren't fucking with them at first even the gina thing we had gina on at the end of the day the other day and they liked her way more than when she was on mad lately a lot of people how much people like them is just kind of like how they're being contextualized and they just have to get used to the person like and but that's the thing with fargo is it's easy to get used to him because he's just hitting you with shit about himself he's so personal with it that it's kind of like you feel like you know him. You get to know him. Because even if somebody sucks, like, I think Fago's good. But even if you think he sucks, it's like, as you get to know him, you're going to start to fucking care one way or another, you know? Which, at this point, with no jumper, having somebody who's willing to, like, tell you about their personal drama and just live their life out on Front Street is just mega, mega valuable, I think. Flacco, Flacco's a wild card. A lot of the clips that go the most viral on the fucking YouTube channel are stuff that's really, like, interpersonal office shit. Like, mm. Adam bitches about House Phone not showing up to his podcast. Or, like, t Rail flips out on Josh for not getting him the right hotel room or whatever. Like, the, those clips are doing, like, hundreds of thousands of views, which is kind of crazy to me. Like, oh, we don't necessarily need a fucking guest to be stirring shit up. We can talk about our own shit, you know? Well, I mean, I think that just goes back to the point of you, like, being able to bring all these people on and, like, build something that kind of feels like a family, mm. you know? So I feel like the viewers kind of feel like they're a part of the family too. Yeah, this is and just it's, and it's easy to do that. Honestly, we just got really lucky with that because I always wanted that, but it just fucking that's hard to achieve. You know? And it's hard. I think I wanted the people like like in my mind, if I was gonna have another version of me, they were gonna have to be like able to do a killer interview like the way that I can and shit. And then like with AD, I kind of realized like oh like. He's totally different than me, and he doesn't even care about doing interviews or whatever, but the audience likes him, and, you know, his, his he could carry his own podcast. That was just, like, a big moment of, like, oh, fuck, like, they like him, and he's, he doesn't have to be doing all the exact things that I can do. And then with the T-Rail thing and the Duno and, and people really starting to, put, like, like House Phone and Disconnected and stuff, now it's, like, now I can really see it because it's, like, we have a bunch of different types of characters, but when I think about the Melrose days, we we were around enough interesting people that we could have done a lot more content, and I probably could have gave people shows back then, but I just I hadn't, like, fully wrapped my head around what it would be like yet. Yeah, I mean, this shit's hard to do, you yeah. know? Like, <laughs> I feel like we it's just, you know, a part of us just put trying, yeah. you know? Because, I mean, it's not... I mean, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Well, I feel like you know? that's this is what we're going to see in the future. A lot of people are going to try to build... A, a network yeah you know like a label but for youtube channels type shit and now i honestly think a bunch of people are trying like you saw joe joe budden kind of strike out and now i feel like he's kind of quit like he even I, I was watching him talk to academics he said he's like i don't think that's for me like he just doesn't think it's the move you know it's fucking hard <laughs> it is hard it just kind of <laughs> happened though honestly like we yes we were trying but it, it really kind of just happened and like that's my thing now is like how do i better build a system by which I can see a lot more people trying out because it's like if I can look at a hundred people trying out in a day and try and you know make content with it like that's why I'm really wanting to do a store is because I feel like with the store we could do like tryouts for on camera personalities and shit and make content out of it and everything but yeah I don't know I mean, we just went to the new warehouse today. I'm excited for that. Super excited, but I don't want everybody in LA to know where it is either. So, oh no, <laughs> no. Just, I mean, like in terms of like having like, I don't want a hundred people in a day to go there. Oh yeah, It'd be kind of weird. I was just thinking about the growth and the next chapter and this shit. That's what's weird. I've been kind of sitting on my hands for like fucking six months or however long, waiting for the fucking the new office to be ready because that feels like that's going to be when the new part of the business really starts to take shape and i don't think any of the guys really like get how much sicker it's going to be being in this big ass space i don't think they've seen it yeah i know I was once just... they're in there they're going to get it but for now they're just kind of like well, how the fuck could this possibly be taking so long which i totally totally understand they put up the walls today mm -hmm. with some of them mm -hmm. man i'm excited 
Me too. I'm definitely excited. All right, one of my, one of my notes I wanted to talk about. What was your very first podcast like? So, if I really want to be honest, back in the day in Long Beach, in like 2013, we did a couple of podcasts like in our living room, like a couple of the BMX homies together. And I remember like the first one we did that never came out was this dude Ryan Navazio, who's like one of the best BMX filmers. He's like super amazing filmer and editor made some of the best videos of all time kind of dipped out on the industry maybe like 10 years ago or whatever hasn't really been doing that much bmx content but i interviewed him and at the time i don't think he had really done an interview and i was super hyped on it and then he just fucking hits me up and he's like yo i don't want to put that out i feel like i sounded lame or i don't i don't know what his reason was he just didn't like the way he sounded or you know this is like early days of content where it's like it was just like a more foreign concept for this dude to do an hour long interview. So he said that I was bummed that really kind of fucked up my momentum. Like we did a couple more after that, but I don't know. It's like, I just let that one L sort of like just slow me the fuck down on doing these BMX podcasts, you know? And then I remember soon after that, there's this like big inner bike, this BMX convention. We got a suite and we set up all these mics and shit. And we like recorded interviews with like every company or like mm-hmm. you know, 15 companies however many during the course of uh the week uh that we were there or the couple of days that we were there and so that kind of like you know opened my mind a little bit more like okay doing these or whatever but then you know it's just such a pain to ask doing a podcast in your living room you know and our, our whole thing with the mics and everything was kind of wonky but then as soon as we got the the store that's when I started really working on it, and we got like you know I hired a guy off Craigslist to help me manage the sound. I ordered all this equipment, a fucking Craigslist, whatever. And so you're searching up like, I remember, I, yeah, I watched like ten videos in a row, like all the videos with the most <laughs> views of like how like what's the best mic for a podcast. That's sick. Just trying to like figure it out and like come to, came to some conclusions. Okay, okay, I need a mixer. Okay, whatever. And then I hired this guy. And was just paying him like 20 bucks an hour or whatever this guy mark and fucking he was like a total fucking goofy ass guy <laughs> that had nothing to do with this shit but he knew what he's talking about and he helped me set it up he helped me order the right stuff off of craigslist and I, that's why i would encourage for a lot of people if you're like me and you have no technical knowledge just pay somebody who's on craigslist or whatever i put up an ad he responded boom he's helping me out that gave me a lot of uh you know confidence in the beginning that my shit would sound good at least and then i remember the the first one was stevie churchill and brandon began talking about uh just bmx and stuff and they were like the two hottest bmx drivers at the time and they were also like my best friends and like the fucking dudes on the team at the time were really killing it so that was a no-brainer and then xavier wolf was the second one and that kind of opened my mind to wow so so i had like a real hit with the bmx one Cause, and especially because we had a clip that I think did like a million views of them talking about the El Toro crash where Brandon Began smashed his oh, face I on the ground. I don't even think we put the full podcast on YouTube because at the time the mentality was like, oh, we need to grow the SoundCloud and the iTunes and everything. So we'll put a clip on YouTube and then we'll drop the full thing on, uh, on uh, the podcast apps. Wow. That was my mentality at the time. But it, then even by the second one with the Xavier Wolf one, I just put it right on YouTube. Because you always seen it as a potential business? Uh, I just like had read a bunch of stuff that was like, oh, before you drop a podcast, like you should have a bunch of them ready and mm. you should drop them in this way so that you'll rise to the top of the charts wow. on the on the, uh, the, I, the the Apple podcast app, which is like the whole thing at the time. Like that's the only place where it mattered how your podcast did or whatever. So I just like wanted to do it right. And at the time it was still like kind of a new idea to be dropping like video podcasts on YouTube. Right. right? You know, like it seemed like the place to put it was on the Apple podcast app. So, but it is kind of crazy to think that of those two, like I had a bunch of ones that didn't do that good before that, doing the inner bike shit and doing the stuff in my living room. But then I started doing the office and I have a hit BMX one. And then my first rap one was pretty popular and, and people started hitting me up about it. And that really got me gas. Like at that point, there was no way I was not going to do it. Like I was just getting, you know, I got some money from, from, you know, getting a million views on a clip. Like, Oh fuck. We just actually had a good day on YouTube because of this, you know? And then like, the other one, like, doing pretty good in the rap thing and opening doors that way, I was just all over it, yeah. I mean, I just think it's pretty nuts that your very first experience with podcasting was a bad one. You yeah. You know, some, that, that could 
like ruin people in the sense of just like giving up, you know, like not even going back to it. And like a lot of times, a different lane. when you look at poker players who stick with it for a long ass time and are like they fall in love with the game and they just stick with it for 20 years or whatever, they start playing and they win a fucking big tournament like early on mm. and they win like 50 grand or whatever. And that just like all of a sudden they spend the fucking rest of their life chasing after that one really, really good experience, you know? Yeah. Whereas if you start playing poker in the first five tournaments you enter, you fucking just fuck up over and over and over and you don't win any money. Okay. Maybe you'll love it so much you'll keep going. But like, you know, if you start out doing like, I look at those ones that did good in the store as like, okay, I did good early on, but luckily I was able to move. And even before those, those ones I'm talking about recording in the office and stuff, like my version of podcasting before that was writing. I spent like a year or two just every day trying to write. I was like, go to this fucking coffee shop whenever I wasn't riding and just try to write. And through that, and I was just really trying to get smarter at this mm-hmm. time. I was just like, I want to really understand the world around me. So I started to like listen to a ton of podcasts at night and I'm watching documentaries and I'm really, I'm just like thinking of things that I don't know about. Like, I remember just thinking like, I don't know that much about politics. I need to really like learn what the fuck people are talking about because it's not something I plan on talking about on the podcast, but if I feel like, you know, I just, if I, I knew that if I was going to become a writer or a podcaster or whatever, that I was just going to have to like be smarter. So I started really focused on that. And then I started to look at the podcast like, oh, this is way better than writing. Because writing is like you're sitting around fucking constructing a sentence, you know, figuring out how to put words together. It's a very technical thing. Whereas this right here, I'm just like effortlessly putting ideas together. If you were to transcribe what I'm saying right now, it would not be very impressive. It would be fucking really pretty shitty in comparison to like something properly written but it's so much more spontaneous you could pump out so much more content you know whereas writing like i remember i had like a little a little review of a future mixtape published on noisy like the vice thing yeah i mean nobody really gave a fuck i mean (laughs) i think just learning the fundamentals of like organization in storytelling that's what you know is the key thing to learn with like you, you practice writing because i took a i I took an english class and that that changed my life in like uh Mm -hmm. like junior year like i had i I flipped that switch where it's just like okay like let let me like take in everything you know like it's it's weird Mm. writing i had that in my notes i was like this dude adam is a good writer yeah i can write decent not as good as like somebody who's really good but I could put my thought sometimes I'll write like an email to somebody I'll like have this crazy like brainstorm and, and it ends up being like a four paragraph email to the team or to whoever about like something that I've been thinking about or a business that I want to do or something I want to add to the business and I'll look at it before I send it and just be like damn like that's a fucking blog post right there like that's crazy I just wrote you just feel like put it together like that because normally that would be like a meeting where I'm just ranting and it wouldn't be like some record of it. Do you, you feel know? like people? Do you feel like people expect that from you to have that in your tool tool bag? Like, oh no, I could really, really bar up a, a, a nice article. I feel like I could, but also I feel like I don't want to. Like, th- I, there, I have a big urge to write a book, mm. but I kind of feel like I would just like work with somebody and like have them sort of turn my thoughts into a book. Like, I, I feel like I would be so overwhelmed with just the duty of putting that many words together and stuff that I don't know. But you seem like the type of person who's, who likes challenges. I like, do. But like, I feel like that might be too big of a challenge. Because you just have to think about the opportunity cost. Because it's like, if I'm going to put 20 hours a week into writing a book, I mean, 20 hours is a lot of fucking podcasts, you know? That would be a very big sacrifice in comparison to everything else that I have going on, you know? Yeah, that's facts. I mean, maybe not now, but later on. You know, I think I would have to get away from everything. You go, know? To, go to Key West, stay there for like a couple of weeks. Yeah, you know, I, I am taking. I'm taking some time off this uh, this this summer. We got a couple of week long like trips planned. You know, I'm trying to like get more comfortable with like living life, not just podcasting all the fucking time. Because at a certain point, I just feel like it. You know, in a week where I do ten or twelve podcasts, by the time I get to the last one. My brain is just not what it is at the beginning of the week. What, what's your ideal vacation? Uh, Well, you mentioned Hawaii. Like, that really is my favorite place to go. And mm-hmm. if I were to go somewhere, like, if I were to just go somewhere where I wanted to, like, have no distractions and just be able to write or, like, work on something, yeah. But probably... what kind of person are you on vacation? Uh, when I'm on vacation, I just, like, let's 
go get a really good breakfast at some spot that Lena has found on fucking <laughs> on on you know Yelp or whatever. Eat a really good breakfast. Go walk around. Go to the beach. Go you know check some part of town out that she's found out about. It was really good because like all my traveling before was like BMX. You know, like we go somewhere. And then you meet up with somebody who's going to take you around and you just ride through the city. It's such an amazing place, a uh, way to travel. Cause you just get such an intimate look at the city or whatever. But in terms of my life now, yeah, it's especially with the kid. It's more like you're only going to have so many different things that you're going to do. But I just like to chill as hard yeah. as I possibly can now. Or even like, like last week, Monday through Friday, I'm doing hella fucking content. I get back at Saturday at like 2 p.m. And I just put my phone on Do Not Disturb and I'm just playing with the kid and in my mind, that's like me healing my brain from mm. all the fucking podcasting and shit from the week before because I'm just like, I feel like I need to just try to separate myself from just the grind. You know, and just Sunday, it's like we're going to the park. We're fucking, you know, going to some burger spot that she wants to check out. I'm just walking around the plaza with my kid. I'm just trying to like become like more of a normal person. Just let your brain settle down. Just chill. Appreciate your life. And then it's like, okay, next day is Monday. We gotta film a bunch of shit. Yeah, how <laughs> stressful know? is it, like, just to be you? <laughs> uh, it's not stressful anymore because I'm actually doing all right money wise now. You know, it's stressful as fuck when I was like struggling business wise more, and I felt like, oh my god, I need to grind these fucking podcasts because if I make an extra five k this month or whatever, then that's going to be like a a big difference in my financial state when i was kind of trying to dig myself out of debt and shit that was mm. like that uh, and, and what I, year was that uh like 2019 or some shit oh shit it was when i like realized like oh fuck i owe all this money and i just started to like it just kind of became like a grind but not in a good way it was like i was trying to like just work to like put out this fire and i did like realistically i grinded my fucking ass off especially streaming music and shit but I did take my eyes off the prize in terms of the bigger, like, long-term goal. Like, when I look at Cole Bennett, I feel like I'm looking at somebody who didn't sacrifice in the short term. Like, he just did shit that he thought was cool. You know, I've said this in other interviews, but I just feel like the only thing I regret is just doing shit that I didn't ultimately think was cool for money, you know? You ever you ever were close to giving up on this shit? No. That wasn't in the books or an option? <sighs> I mean, after I fucking got dropped by Atlantic and, like, not when I got dropped by Atlantic, but when I first had those fucking accusations or whatever, that was when I was, like, scared. Like, oh, fuck. Everybody hates me. Like, what am I going to fucking do? And then, I don't know, I, like, went to the store and everybody was still cool. And I'm like, oh, fuck. Like, Twitter is not 100% real life. Like, I fucking, uh, you know, people still. And then I made a video talking about it and all the comments were just fucking with me. Like, bro, don't don't listen to that shit we all believe in you yada yada but that was definitely like the hardest thing i ever to go th had to go through in terms of like staying focused you know no nah, i totally get it like you kind of have to once you i'm sure you have to go through growing pains like that when you're trying to become the biggest in the game you know <laughs> like yeah and i wasn't even trying to be like the biggest in the game or anything i was just trying to like see how far i could take it and just do as much as i possibly could you know and, like even now, I really resist the urge to, like, compare myself against other channels and shit. And, like, when I hear people doing the, like, top five conversation, I'm just like, just leave me out of it. I don't even want to be on this fucking – I don't want to be talked about in this way. No. I feel it. Um, Speaking of, like, early interviews, the X one, how did you get that one? That was just everybody – everybody was commenting, saying, interview this dude. Name stood out to me a lot. Like, what the fuck is this name? This doesn't does not look like an actual rapper's name. And then I uh, listened to his shit on SoundCloud. Thought it was cool. Clicked on his name on Twitter. Saw that he had DM me or something. I was like, yeah, let's do it. You know, at that time, my standard for like interviewing somebody was not really that high. And I only say that in the sense that like he didn't have that many plays or like followers or anything like that. Like, you know. Uh, but I just. I felt the momentum and I had seen some videos of him fighting mm. and I just thought like, dude, this kid is fucking got a lot of chaotic energy around him. So he just came out and did it. And what's funny is that when I do the interview, I stop it around the hour mark and I get a lot of comments uh, or like people mention like that I stopped the interview. And, and what's funny is that I stopped the interview to do a BMX interview that probably did like 10,000 views. 
and the X interview did 20 million views, which is just so crazy to think about. But I mean, I was at that time I was doing like one or two BMX episodes a week and one or two no jumper interviews a week, which to me now the idea of doing four podcasts a week sounds pretty chill. At that time, it was like I'm ripping my fucking hair out. I'm stressed out. I'm like yelling at my friends and shit because I was like not doing a good enough job managing the stress. You know, I'm trying to like go out and ride BMX eight hours a day with all the homies, go home, either be studying for interviews or doing interviews, chasing hella pussy at that time. Like my life was just a fucking total chaotic mess. But yeah. Damn. I could only imagine. That shit must have been nuts. Like from g- going from y- your first one, you know, gets cut, whatever. Then it's like you kind of find success in the in the BMX, and then the transition to the rap. Mm. Like you immediately had success in the rap. Like you had the first one with you said Xavier. Who yeah, was it? which did really good at the time. And to me, he was like a massive rapper. You know, it's like I, when I look back at the numbers and stuff, I'm like, damn. It was really not that big a deal. There's, like, a lot of rappers I could interview now who would probably have made the same amount of noise. But, you know, he was considered cool at the time, and people fuck. And like, Puya reached out and was just like, yo, I fuck with that Xavier Wolf interview. Like, I want you to do my first interview. Wow. Okay, which so. was a huge honor because I'm I, – I think even, like, in Xavier Wolf's eyes, like, Puya was a much more popular rapper than him at that time. Like, he was a bigger rapper, whether he would admit that or not, like – he just seemed like a bigger rapper even though he's still totally underground he's like not signed and shit but it seemed like a big deal and i mean if you look at my early rap interviews it is like pretty pretty high quality like i think x was in like the first 20 interviews that i did and that just started booming from the beginning like suicide boys were super early because the puya one was just like oh boom suicide boys like that just led right from that i was on this such a natural streak of just meeting all these people and like at that time, I used to do the thing that I don't do now, but that I know would be the number one thing that would be able to make me get way more guests and shit is I would go out mm. like every night. I would fucking go to a rap show. I would go hang out at a bar or, cl- or whatever. You know, we were just out and about, and I would be down to, like, you know, I remember there was, like, a weekend where 21 Savage played, like, a show in L.A. and a show in the O.C., and I went to both of the shows and lingered around by the stage or like i had his manager's fucking dm and she gave me her number so i'm texting her the whole time like trying to just get the facetime and just saying what up and just meeting him because i wanted that fucking interview so bad and i didn't get it but like and it was i was so out of my depths too like i had my interview ready prepared but i was trying to like you know wrangle him so he would do it he's like the most gangster motherfucker in the world I'm so not ready for that at the time, but I was so determined to get it because I believed in them so much. I just don't do that shit anymore. But if I did, I mean, that's the number one thing that would get me way more interviews, just FaceTime with people. But it's hard to burn the candle at both ends. You know, it's hard to get up at fucking 7 in the morning and do work out and spend time with your kids and do all this content and then also go out and stay out till 1 in the morning. Like, I just can't do it, you know. No, yeah, fuck that. But that is how I, like, you know, because whenever I go anywhere, I meet mad people and I fucking find out little stories about them and it makes me research them and line up interviews from it, you know. And I remember Vlad telling me, I remember Vlad saying, I used to do what you do. I used to, like, when I still went out all the time, he's like, I used to do what you do. I used to go all the time, go to events, after parties, listen to events, whatever. And he's like, I got a lot of interviews that way, but I don't do it anymore. He's like, I just, family time. I go home, when work's done. And I remember being like, damn, am I going to be like that? And I'm, like, right, I'm exactly like that. <laughs> but, I think it's yeah. just a natural progression. Yeah. You know, it's just, you just become, you just realize like that clubbing shit is kind of played, mm. you know, going out, you, you know. I mean, people go out, what, to network because they're trying to be something in life and to get pussy and to get fucked up. I'm over getting pussy. I'm over getting fucked up. And I already know enough people and have built enough of a resume for me that realistically I could probably get the interviews that I want to get, you know, without having to go hang out at the club. So, But what I should do is I should do it like once or twice, you know, like I should do it like once a week, or like once or twice a week or whatever. But I was AD actually can, really AD motivated. Can line that up. I was really motivated to do it. And then I got COVID mm. and then AD stopped drinking, which AD still goes out. So that's not really a good excuse. But just the fact that like, I realized that, like, oh, fuck. Like, I got COVID right when I read an article about Zach Bia. They were making it out, like, oh, my God, he's so successful because he goes out, because he clubs. 
because he does DJ sets at clubs. Like, that's how he knows all these people, and that's why he's this big success story now. And I was just thinking, like, fuck, I need to do that. And then I got COVID, and then AD quit drinking, <laughs> like, immediately after. Because AD was, like, you know, the person I was probably going to go out with at the time. But that, I, I need to do that exact thing again. That's fucking nuts. It's funny you say Zach Bia, too, because I was in New York on vacation one time, and I'm like... It was over summer. I'm riding this bike home at like four in the morning, like kind of drunk from the fucking club or whatever. I look, it's fucking Zach Bia on the street. And I just like pull my bike around and say, what's up? But it was just like the most randomest thing. So for you to be like, yeah, it's because he's outside. You know, I seen him outside literally 4 a.m. I mean, you make a lot of fucking connections by just doing real human shit like that. You know, DMing people's good. It works like pretty good, but you meet somebody in real life. A lot of times that's like, oh, you're just your buddies. You're cool with each other for the next like 20 years. I don't know. I feel like it doesn't co- really make that much sense. COVID, COVID brought me with like being content of just like chilling, <laughs> chilling at the house. Yeah. You know, COVID was the best. I loved it. It was, it fucking sucked, but it was sick at the same time. Like it was just the pressure was so low. Cause when I look at my life right now, it's like I'm working my ass off. And when I look at all of my peers and all the people I compare myself to a little bit, you know, try not to co- fully compare myself to him, but I look at him and I'm like, fuck, like I want to go as hard as him. Like, I don't want to fucking go to sleep at night feeling like Vlad's working 10 times harder than me. You know, I want to work just as hard as him. I want to work just as hard as this other YouTube channel that I just found out about. You know, I see fucking small ass interviewers with like 100,000 subscribers or 50,000 subscribers, whatever, getting interviews that I wish I got. And I'm like, fuck, if I had fucking DM that guy, they would have totally done the interview with me instead of this guy. You know? So I'm fucking, in my head, I'm still, like, eagerly competing with fucking, you know, 23-year-old kids and shit. Like, which is dope. Like, I fucking, realistically, those interviews that I'm, like, scolding <laughs> myself in my head like I should have got that, it's like, what, it's the difference between me making, like, an extra, like, you know, couple thousand bucks? It's like, it's not, it doesn't matter. But it's like the rep. Though. I want to do it. You know, it's like I fucking love doing this shit, and I want to tell as many stories as I can. So you're still like constantly searching for new music and shit like that. New personalities, yeah, more than anything. You know, like, mm. cause like music. Okay, but them having good music or whatever it doesn't mean they're gonna be a great interview. Although I do want to interview like all the up and coming rappers. You know. So I'm always just looking for, you know, that's why I interview so many YouTubers and shit. Because I actually genuinely am, like, kind of more interested in watching a YouTuber's content than, you know, some guy who's got some cool music, but he's actually boring as fuck. Well, they kind of get the content thing side of it, right? Because by definition, if you are popping on YouTube, then you pretty much have to have an interesting personality, right? Like, Or you understand the game in some way or in another. You have to be a talker, pretty much. Yeah. That's (laughs) That's <laughs> you get you get rappers that just give you one word shit one word answers. Yeah, sometimes. Little Terrio, you in the room for that one? No, I I left. Yeah, he is thirteen. You ever just be like, man, just let's just stop here. Just want to just you try to help him out because as an interviewer, you want you want him not to look stupid, right? So you want to kind of shape the convo and kind of like yeah. make it interesting you just do the best you can you know and that's why i almost like i like having flaco as a podcast ho- co-host it's kind of easy to like bounce back and forth when you're asking somebody questions you know and he's somebody i actually like don't mind the questions he asks you know like he could, he could be better at times but like how do you not get burnt out of this shit uh i don't know i would just think like each podcast for me is like a mental like you you get mentally tired kind of yeah Definitely. I mean, I just try to fucking, like, go home and just have, like, three hours where I'm not thinking about podcasting before I go to sleep. And then I try to just, like, get a good night's sleep, work out in the morning, and then just pack at it. Like, just, you know, that's my little rest, and then I'm just back at it. Like, that's the whole fucking challenge. What I hate, though, is when I have interviews all week and I have to literally, like, do three interviews, go home after just being on camera for six hours, and the only thing I have time to do when I'm home is research the people I'm interviewing the next day and then sleep and then wake up and fucking boom, right back at it. That shit is it's taxing. But, I mean, I don't turn it down because it's just like, I don't know. I just don't. I just want all the content I can get if I'm actually interested in it or I think it's good for the channel, you know? Like, I've been – like, I, I think of the BMX site as, some, as, like, the precursor to No Jumper. And in that sense, I've been really just working my ass off at – 
this for 16 years. Mm. And it's just like trying to make the best content I can. And when I think about it, when I look at myself as a youngin, I was like nine, ten years old, so obsessed with magazines and like VHS tapes and just like, you know, music. And I was, I was interested in the labels or putting the music out. And I just always wanted to like understand subcultures. I was just fascinated by music and, and media, really. Wow. Like the fucking comic book magazine that I was into when I was into comic books when I was like 10 or whatever, 11. It was like, you know, I would, I would fucking check the mailbox so eagerly for that thing because I just loved it so much. And, uh, you know, pretty much as soon as I got a chance, I just started making content. What know? kind of student were you? Terrible. Mm. Awful. Yeah. I was just like, and I tried, honestly. Like, I fucking just really, really did bad in school. No matter how hard I tried, I had to go to summer school and shit. Damn. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't good at all. Did you go to college? I went to one year at a local community college called Northern Essex Community College. My mom was a librarian at a college, a community college, like, you know, 10 miles down the road from there. So as a result, I got free tuition in the state of Massachusetts. So I was able to go without paying tuition for one year. My mom basically told me when I graduated high school, she was like, you're either getting a full-time job and you got to pay us rent or you're going to college or you can move out. And I was like, well, all right, I guess I'm going to go to fucking college because if I go to college, then you guys won't make me fucking pay rent and I won't have to, like, work as much, you know? So I'll be able to, like, not, you know, so I just did that. And I did really, really good my first year at community college. It was so fucking easy. And I got to take, like, psychology and art classes, which is what I was actually genuinely interested in at that time. So Mm -hmm. that was pretty easy for me to do good in that. I got, like, straight A's my first year at community college. My parents were very confused and that, <laughs> and that, because I had done so bad in high school. But I was, like, just taking the stuff I wanted. Like, there was just nothing in the world that was going to make me do good on a math test, you know? But I fucking uh, – yeah, and then I did that, and then I went to fucking uh, – so I did, I did good my first year, and then all of a sudden my parents are like, okay, well, maybe you could, you could apply at a better school. So I applied at University of Massachusetts Lowell, which was, you know, 20 minutes away from there or whatever. And I, w- I went there and I stayed on campus and I didn't really like fit in or get along with everybody because I was straight edge and the fucking, oh, it was a bunch of like drunk ass fucking frat boy type dudes on my floor, which I got along with them okay and shit, but I wasn't really, I didn't really have like a social scene in college. You know, I, I would like go off and ride BMX every weekend. You know, I didn't drink, so I wasn't going to parties and shit like that really. Uh, and I was into like hardcore and shit. So I was going to shows and shit, like watching bands play and stuff. And like by the end, and, and I got into the credit card fraud while I was in college that second year. So by the end of the, You're that, trapping, I, was, I was over it. Scamming. Yeah. yeah. I was just over it. I was like, I'm not doing it. I'm moving to New York. My parents uh, were super bummed. Yo, you've been in the mosh before? Crazy. You be throwing down? I was going for it. <laughs> and. I could say that Boston, early 2000s era Boston hardcore shows were, and I think a lot of people who know all about hardcore would agree with this, were the most violent shows maybe in the history of hardcore. So, like, oh, when I saw Converge play in uh, at, at Metal Fest in, I think, 2003, I saw more insane violence bitches getting knocked the fuck out dudes <laughs> getting jumped cra- more violence in you know you know a 40 minute band's set than i've probably seen since then in total it was the craziest shit ever what that was your first show no but oh. i was going to show since i was like 15 i was probably like 19 going to that show but that just stood out to me as like holy fuck this is the craziest shit i ever seen and just all kinds of other fights i seen around that time, bro. i seen the gnarliest shit. You said bitches were getting knocked out? Bad. I remember watching- like multiple bitches getting knocked out? Let me tell you a tale. There was a, a hardcore show I went to, and uh, there was like a gang crew type thing called FSU in Boston. And there was a dude from FSU, and the promoter, who was like a mob guy or, or some shit, he was on some tough guy shit, the promoter, or the guy who owned the, the club- went to one of these dudes in FSU and basically flashed a gun at him and started popping shit and talking talking shit whatever like basically just acting tough to him and so these FSU dudes go back to the car and they get hammers and they come back and they see that dude 
and they fucking proceed to cave this motherfucker's head in with hammers and his his girl his wife tried to run up like a uh, thick fucking 45 year old lady drunk at the bar or whatever and she tried to run up and stop him wow this bitch gets her whole face fucked up <gasps> with a hammer too his his friend tries to run up i guess none of his friends had straps and i guess these guys didn't give a fuck that he had a strap on him but they fucked this dude up so bad and i'm like 19 just watching this just like damn some hammers it gets real that's crazy. I remember watching some gangland thing on like A and E. That about FSU, FSU is what that was about, yeah. Holy shit! Because they were like a straight edge gang, right? Some of them were, but mm. not not all of them. Oh, okay. But they were they were like the crew. Like you couldn't even have a crew in Boston. Like you couldn't even like. I remember we were on tour with some bands, and we started joking around, calling ourselves something, but it was like some three letter acronym of like whatever. But it was a joke a joke crew name or whatever. But I remember by the end of the tour. Like some of the older dudes reminded us, like, "Yo, when we get back to Boston, don't say that shit." Because if they start to feel like it's a real thing, they'll fucking beat your ass to remind you that this shit is not cool. Like they were the only crew. Damn, it was a whole thing. That sounds wild. Yeah, I never been to a hardcore show, but some of my boys have, and they be telling me how they be just like throwing down and moshing, just like knocking people out and shit. Like, there's a vlog on uh, No Jumper that's like Lil Pump and the hardcore show or some shit like that, and it's like Lil Pump hanging out at the store and everything, and then we go to this hardcore show, and Tony Malou filmed it, and he filmed the fuck out of it, like filmed it so good of my friend's uh, band Incendiary playing, and it's really really crazy, but also it's like. It's just so much less violent than the shows that I grew up going to. The, sh- the shows I grew up going to was really like motherfuckers like running to the edge of the pit and boom, boom, just punching people in the face. Like <laughs> all around. I, like it really was what? fun. Like if you looked at it and you weren't like familiar with this kind of moshing, you would just be like, what? Like it was the craziest thing I'd ever seen. And that's part of what made me so fascinated. Honestly, like, and when I look at the way that I'm like really fascinated by the streets and shit now. I look back at that and I'm like, you were always like this, dude. And I was like, why didn't you bang the set, man? Why didn't you get put on, man? You had to be tough as fuck. <laughs> they were not fucking with me like that. FSU no. Adam. No. You had to be the the hardest of the hardcore. Oh shit. You ever knock someone out? Many times. <laughs> Just like in the in the mosh pit. In though? the mosh pit and outside the mosh pit. But We'd- I also got knocked on myself, so you know. Damn. So like before the show, you're just like thinking about this, or does it just happen? Like I'm about to knock someone out tonight, or I remember like one time, like because you know it's such a, like a bullshit like code of conduct in the mosh pit, where like I remember one time I seen this like dude who just pushed this girl I know in the mosh pits, and like you know realistically like how many girls that I pushed in the mosh pit probably like infinite, like you know, but he pushed a girl I know, so I just walked up to him like as if I was moshing like with my back to him. And just boom, and just p- fucking knock this dude out, and, I, and then like, I, but I was pretending to really be moshing, right? So I'm like, you know, dancing back to the other side. And I look over and I see the fool on his back, and I'm just like, oh damn, I just knocked out like a fucking teenager. Well, I mean, I was like 19, so it's like, you know, but he didn't look grown. <laughs> but I mean, it was like that, like you know, it was like dudes were just using the music as like an excuse to beat the fuck up. I got a people. title: Adam knocks out little kids at concerts. He was probably like my age, maybe like a year younger or something. I don't know. Don't see, don't see, rail me. Oh shit, dude! Shooting Lil Wayne in the face. That one was, yeah, that was that one was pretty sick. It's clever. That one was pretty sick. That one, that one was tight. Hardcore music shit used to scare me. I'm not even gonna lie, bro. It was honestly a very scary subculture. Like the dudes I know, like the worst dudes in that shit are like damn near as bad as like certain gang members I know and shit. You got into hardcore music before you got into rap. Honestly, I was into rap first. I got into rap from like Snoop and Dre and Easy E and NWA and all this shit when I was like nine. And then I remember in like fourth grade, I got into uh, fucking Green Day. And that was like the first rock band I liked. And then I started to kind of like go down a bunch of different little journeys where I got interested in like metal. And all of a sudden I'm listening to Slayer and fucking, you know. And, and just getting into mostly, I was into like punk and hardcore and shit. You know, listen to a bunch of pop punk and ska and all the stuff that was popular at that time. And then I was even interested in like grindcore and death metal and black metal and all this stuff. But at the same time, I was always really into rap. And then I stopped honestly going to hardcore shows when I was like twenty when I mm-hmm. moved to New York 
I think I had my 21st birthday right after I moved to New York. And I kind of stopped going to hardcore shows then and just started to listen to rap, like, all the time because I was just in my house playing poker all day for, like, three years and also riding BMX, and rap was just the soundtrack to everything. And I, I just, like, didn't really, like, get that into listening to hardcore. I was just, like, rap is, like... It's, there's so much more of it it's constantly changing and progressing and i just really got like more and more enamored with the culture of it and trying to like learn about new artists and decode all these different artists and stuff so like when i look at myself like i listened to rap all through high school and everything but by the time i was like 22 is when i really started to like be tuned in to everything that was 100 percent going into rap but i was reading like every issue of double xl on the source all through high school where you, you going know? to rap shows no, honestly, that's that's the biggest thing is that like I didn't even know about local rap shows in the Boston area because it just wasn't like a thriving scene as far as I know in that time. I didn't really like you know, and I was I was listening to like the Dipset, G Unit, fucking Jay Z, Nas, etc. So like I remember I went to a festival called the Sprite Liquid Mix Tour right after I graduated high school, and it was like Three Eleven and Jay Z were the headliners. But then I also got to see Talib Kweli on that bill and I remember going to it and definitely Tulip Kweli and then Jay-Z were the first rappers that I saw perform live and wow. I was very very geeked on the experience but I, yeah, I, I never even the whole time I lived in New York and shit I went to a few rap shows but not that many it just didn't really I don't know I didn't really like, have anyone to go with because I didn't like nobody else was like as into hip hop as I was like and all it just would have been foreign like all the BMX dudes I hung out with and stuff we just weren't even talking about that like it just never even like came up which I think when you talk to a lot of people like from the hood about going to concerts and shit they're kind of like no like they weren't thinking about that I was riding BMX every day I wasn't thinking about going to a rap show BMX didn't put you on hip hop like they weren't playing BMX and uh, I mean hip hop and BMX parts and shit so when I got into BMX 97 or so almost no hip hop and rap videos wow. tons of emo and indie rock like metal I guess to a certain extent but then there's this company Animal who's like the definitive street BMX brand and they put out their first video in maybe 2001 and that changed everything everything that was like the biggest street video of its time the next one after that can i eat was also insanely gigantic and it was almost all rap mm. and that was like you know it pissed off a lot of people at the time because bmx was way more like rock at the time but that was dope as fuck to me because they were the coolest company and they're using tons of rap and i was already a big rap fan mm. but it was like i don't know they were like a new york centered brand and like the riding was just so new york and the, the you know it's a bunch of black dudes and spanish guys and shit like that they're like hanging out with some white guys but it's like just a very very different version of what it was to be like a young bmx rider you know and it just was like the coolest fucking thing in the world to me at that time what were some of your favorite uh parts uh edwin de la rosa everything he did Vinny salmon like you know in all those animal videos and shit there's this guy Vic ayala who was like unbelievable quit after being pro for a couple of years it was a dude george DeSantos, who in my, my definitive video before that was don't quit your day job and george DeSantos, like I, I i for a while i was calling him the black guy with the yellow bike because i just like <laughs> like the idea of even knowing the pros names was kind of like new to me like i just was like that dude is like he was just so good at riding rails and shit like mind-blowing and uh yeah, I mean that's that's just East Coast. I mean, fucking Bob Scarbo from the East Coast too. Like he was, was another huge one. Was there a a big BMX scene in New York at the time when you were living crazy. there? Crazy early two thousands, dude. It was just fucking nuts. Like it was like that was people were figuring out what street riding was and like what all the tricks were. Like really in real time. Like when you're watching a fucking BMX video these days, a lot of the tricks are like really really advanced versions of like shit that was kind of pioneered around that time it's like watching the old skate videos when they're just skating curbs and shit you know you kind of could yeah. see the progression you know, well like at that actually time, making the tricks yeah and like at that time if someone was doing something on a rail it's like it's, it might have been the first time they ever it had ever been done on a rail you know so many tricks were just being invented at that time it was a very very good time to be in the bmx scene and uh 
you know, it's kind of like that with music too. Like fucking at that time, it's like mixtapes and like a lot of the beats sound janky as fuck. The recordings sound weird. It's not like you know the late '80s or like early '90s era of like hip hop kind of finding itself. But when you listen to Spotify playlists of hip hop now, it's like, I mean, they know what they're doing. <laughs> like they're they're churning out song after song, and there's very little experimenting, and there's very rare that you hear something that shocks you. But like you know, back in the day, it was like you're watching them in real time figuring out what the fuck this is going to be like you know yeah i think there's like mad parallels too with like skateboarding bmx hip-hop you mm. know kind of their popularity and t- on timelines and being accepted and you know just getting more lit basically because i i learned from hip-hop like I, from like skate parts and shit like i just remember bro the soundtrack to this shit played a big big bro a lot of shit and even like the indie rock bands that i know and and like like when i'm fucking put on an mgmt song like fucking which was like the hipster fucking nah, I'm, a, I'm familiar 2009 that shit was so huge but like why did i know about it i guess i did know about it from going to bars and shit and they would just be playing it but also like it was in mad bmx videos so that's just a band that i know and i have like three four songs that i love from but there was so many bands like that that BMX videos just fully immersed me in and it was just because at that time there's only so many videos you're only going to see one two videos per month you know you had to go to the store and buy it you spend 25 fucking dollars on it or whatever and then you would watch it like 30 fucking times minimum probably and every single song in that video was like one potential band that you could now this is early internet days so you could probably like go listen to some shit on their myspace or whatever mm. but it was like the brand new version of that i was still buying cds left and right i was every every dollar i had i was spent on bike parts or cds i don't even know what kids are doing with their money now <sighs> fucking spending it on fortnite weed fortnite and weed <clears throat> that sounds pretty sounds like something i spend my money on um <sighs> fuck man free smoke the podcast i'm fucking loaded <laughs> Um, blunt really hit you today. Bro, the, the blunt got me. I mean, I just think it's dope, bro. The BMX shit. I was, I was the same. I had this DGK video that I was watching. This Kenny Hoyle part had this Kanye West uh, song had Jesus walks on it, mm. and I just remember watching that part all the time. I was just like, bro, this shit is sick. People who don't ride or skate will like not really get what we're talking about, but there's something about when you have like. 40 amazing skate tricks or or fucking bmx tricks perfectly laid over a song filmed perfectly and it's just back-to-back clips and just the spots are crazy as fuck and like the trick that you know everything when everything is working it can make a song so much more than just a song like you know it's like it's really such an amazing thing and i never really became much of an elite bmx editor you know i always pretty much just like hired people to edit for me and i always kind of like wish that i had done more of that but that was definitely because i mean your company would make parts and shit right that was a part of you yeah we put out a video in 2009 and then we like did this denver trip we put out another video we've done a bunch of like full-length videos and shit over the years but I would always like find a filmer slash editor mm. and just like latch onto them and be like, all right, I'm gonna pay you this. You film this shit. Like I'll fucking line up the trips and I'll go on the trips and help direct it. But it always just seemed like it made more sense to like put the filming in somebody who was more experienced hands. Which hey, credit to me that I always kind of like knew that that like it was probably I wasn't gonna be the guy spending forty hours editing a fucking BMX DVD or whatever. Like that just wasn't the best use of my time. When did you start making money in BMX? Pretty much right after I started that website. It come up when I was 22, 2006. Like, I did it for maybe a year before companies started hitting me up and, like, paying me. And I remember I quit playing poker once I was making two Gs a month. So I was like, this is all I need to live. and put all my time into this and just focus on this. And so that was the come up. The come up. 2006 to maybe like 2014. Well, that was my whole fucking life. Every day, wake up, post shit. What did you guys post? You just BMX videos, news, some articles here and there, you know. And then I started making YouTube videos of the BMX stuff, and that led me to No Jumper, basically. Like, but when I started No Jumper, it was like I'm making iPhone vlogs of me going out and doing shit, and I'm doing interviews. And I'd already been doing the BMX interviews, and I'd already been making vlogs of BMX shit. 
So it just made sense. I mean, I kind of feel like those early parts, like, you know, those DGK videos or whatever, they were kind of vlogging, you know? They're kind of vlog s. They would vlog, and then they would just take, like... I really respect it. They would take, like, a fucking two-second clip of a homeless person taking a shit. Yeah. And that's, like, the B-roll. The hijinks. Where, whereas, was the, that's the lame thing about vlogging is that, like, you know, a homeless person tries to fuck with you, <laughs> and you give it this lame-ass title about, like, homeless guy tries to kill me, and you play the whole footage, you know, and, like, but, well, but there are a lot of good vlogs these days. But, like, early BMX vlogging was just so lame. I mean, it got probably more accepted, too. Vlogging was looked at as fucking lame. Especially in skateboarding. I mean, the and way I'm people sure do BMX. it a lot is, is fucking lame, you know? A lot of people make it lame. But you don't mean, have to be lame. I you mean, know, Nelk showed us that, and, like, fucking even David Dobrik showed us, oh, oh, it could be a vlog, and it doesn't have to be some long, drawn-out bullshit, you know? Are you watching vlogs nowadays? It's, yeah, just to watch how people do their thing, you know? Kind of see, see the environment. Yeah, see what's going on. Yeah, I definitely have had a lot of fun editing the vlogs lately and just kind of just doing having the progression like i feel like the vlogs have been stepping up yeah no that shit's definitely dope we got the nice little team 916 Mm. productions but that's why i want to fucking i want to have the store because there's so much more crazy shit happens that we could vlog you know were you bummed that that shit didn't work out no i mean i pulled the plug but it just wasn't the right spot at the right time we got to just be in the right spot i don't know do you feel like a store is even possible yeah i mean we could do it it's like we, we could do it and like pay the rent and pay the fucking employees out of pocket and not make anything on the store and it wouldn't be that big a deal but you know, just want to do the right spot at the right time with the right neighbors and the right vibe so we'll see we'll figure it out we'll definitely figure it out yo before we wrap up i wanted to talk to you about um like going to therapy mm. when did you start that Well, I did it when I was, like, 16 Mm. because uh, I got fucking arrested for graffiti, like, two times in one year. My parents were so fucking mad at me. And uh, they made me go to fucking therapy to figure out what I was so angry about. And it was very helpful to me at that time. And uh, then I didn't do it my whole life after I was 16 until a couple years ago. I started doing it once a week. And I honestly think it's very, very helpful. It's helped me get past a lot of sort of self-doubt and like reoccurring thought patterns and shit you know yeah i feel like especially if you're a podcast host and you're able to have those conversations with a therapist you kind of can mirror those types of convos you know yeah i mean it's like your guests. it gives you that safe space to be able to talk about your life and just fully vent and be honest about your shit without like you know you just can't do that with your girl because realistically your girl is going to judge you and there's just going to be stuff that you want to say that you know you can't talk openly to your girl about your girl you know not your girl but girl in general <laughs> I feel you. you know and it's like other shit like you know like sometimes you have like a really good friend that you feel like you can say everything to but what about when you start having problems with them or whatever and it's like the the weird thing about it is that my life had like gone through so many fucking changes and i just hadn't been able i i hadn't like you know been able to wrap my head around it and that was like what i got from shutting the store down a and the pandemic was like i was able to fully step back just be around my fucking situation like you know it just it it just got weird like just going from like a regular guy to a person that like couldn't even fucking walk down the street on melrose because so many people were running up on me you know so like all of a sudden i'm like DMing with Drake and I'm fucking interviewing all these huge names and it was just like it kind of happened so fast that it was just like mind blowing and that's why I fucking like the pandemic because it helped me you ever had so, you ever felt like pressure like you feel pressure all the time or what yeah because like you know people expect you to live up to your best moments over and over and over in hip hop and it's like realistically it's just like there's not that many X interviews for me to do you know i i I could just do as many interviews as i I can and like try to find the best people that i can but it's like people are always going to compare you to your best moment which is just tough you know and like i came out with this whole fucking crazy ass scene all around me and it was just natural to be interviewing all these people you know and it's just fucking it's kind of hard to live up to that sometimes but you know I, i feel like you know that what no jumper is changes over time and it's like we're not this thing that's focused around a store right now but we are this big ass crew with a bunch of fucking really dope personalities on it so it's like you know it just changes and morphs into different things over time i guess you feel like 
you feel like going back to the therapy like it's just it's made you like a a better person like when did you become sober and shit like that like did that all tie in like on the timeline like four years or? ago um the it took me a while to do the therapy after getting sober but yeah it just so wait, you 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 like cut all the drugs and all that shit out yeah just cold turkey one day pretty much yeah I, yeah. Just, I was like going out kind of like every weekend or like every every other weekend for a while just like drinking doing coke and quite often taking pills as well and it just kind of got out of hand you know i just had too many like too many like fun friday nights where i'd be out till six in the morning doing molly and drinking with lena and fucking girls and all this shit and then you know you just feel like deaths all day Saturday and then maybe Sunday you feel all right, but it just started to be like Saturday and Sunday would be fucked up or I'll get fucked up Friday. Keep it going. Once I got up Saturday and then Sunday and Monday, I'm feeling like fucking death. And then like just little things too, like get, you know, even, you know, me and her fucking random girls is all good. And then we get an STD from one of them and it's just like, Oh, now it used to be like just all fun and games and now all of a sudden there's like actual consequences and even that's before fucking having a kid where now the idea of like going out and just getting crazy is just doesn't my you know i'll I'll have a few drinks here and there but i'm just like the drug shit is out for me at this point i just think it's pretty nice that you didn't have like a crazy experience to like make you do that it just started to just not be worth the fucking effort because it was like were, was, were you getting fun. were you getting faded just like because you were f- feeling hella pressure? I mean, or maybe you or just wanted a party, or you know, you just have all these opportunities right in front of you, and it's like you're hanging out with people, and they want to go out and party, and everybody wants to get fucked up, and like you know, even my girl was getting fucked up at the time, and everything, so it just was kind of it felt normal, I guess. Like, oh, this is just what I'm doing. I was I was really just doing what I had been doing before, except now I knew more people, and they had more drugs, and. You know, now all of a sudden it's like I'll go out drinking and I could depend on somebody offering to sell me Coke and Zans or just straight up giving it to me. So it like and everybody who reaches a certain level of clout knows what the fuck I'm talking about, because every rapper I've seen it happen to them, every hot girl I see it happen to them where it's like, oh, you like doing Coke. Okay, well, then you move to L.A., and you start going to the clubs and all of a sudden there's guys who have infinity Coke, infinity bottles uh, tables in the club and and you you know at prior you were doing like a reasonable amount of coke because you had a reasonable amount of money and it just made sense to be reasonable about it but then all of a sudden all that's gone and now you're around people who will fucking do whatever you know it was just kind of like that where all of a sudden it's like oh if i want to fucking go out and party every night the options were right there and i can go out and party with like cool people that i think are fucking dope or whatever but then you know, it just starts to, it just started to like make sense to me of like, fuck, this isn't worth it. Like, I gotta just, just it's chill. easy I'll to be, get lost in the sauce. I'll be way. Ha- I just realized I'll be way happier if I just wake up every day and work on feeling better, or work on feeling healthy and feeling productive and stuff. You know, and now with a kid, it's not even a fucking option. It's just, oh, I can't go out and get fucked up. Like, if I go out, I'm gonna fucking, I'm gonna be on two hours sleep hanging out with my kid, which is like the worst fucking thing ever. Or I'm going to be hung over trying to, I, I want to be present. I want to be as in the zone as possible to like enjoy my fucking kid being at the stage that she's in, you know? And, uh, the idea that I would like diminish my ability to do that just so that I could like go to the club and look cool or have, you know, that shit never really was all that cool to me, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to get to that point in my life where I'm just like, I don't just, you know, want to chill. Yeah. <laughs> not, but, you know, not, you don't have to do it prematurely, you know? You see people settling down and shit. It's like a huge error is like setting settling down with the wrong chick or, a, you know, too early or whatever, you know? I'm just lucky that I fucking waited till I was pretty old realistically and have a girl that I actually, like, know I can trust, like, before I get into it and stuff. I see people having kids and then they're divorced, like, the next year, and it's just like, holy fuck. Oh, yeah, that's facts. Yeah. You about to have another kid? Hell yeah. How many kids you want? At least two. At least maybe two? three, maybe four. Damn. I'm Adam. trying to convince her to do the surrogate shit after the second one. What's that? You get, like, a person to carry it for you. 
but it's still your shit. You're like, yeah, it looks like you still. Yeah, like they, it's not like her eggs. It's like they put, I, I'm probably saying it wrong, but they put like her eggs or whatever into this girl, and they like get the baby started growing. I don't, I don't even think I'll fuck her. I think you you just have like a sperm yeah. sample or whatever. They put it together. They grow the baby inside it, and then she delivers the baby. You pay her like whatever, and that way the girl like Lena wouldn't have to have it taxing her body. But then it's, it's a lot of trust like involved. Some baller shit. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people who do it. Sometimes it sounds celeb- expensive. Celebrities and shit. I think it is, but I think it's like a hundred grand. You got to pay the girl or something. Yeah, and you got really who trust would, her. Who would do it? Who know. would hold it for you? I don't know. Gina. Skybree. <laughs> <laughs> no and no. <laughs> oh shit. Hey, do you think there's an expiration? I mean, obviously there is, but like how long do you see yourself like doing porn? <laughs> um Well, the interesting thing about blog talk is that it really is like the same as no jumper in the sense that it's just like I'm looking at the market, I see a hole, I see an entry point, I see something that I can bring to the table that isn't currently being done. And so I just start it, do the content, grow it, see what we can turn it into. So for me, it's like, do I really, am am I like dying to do porn 10 years from now? Probably not. Realistically, if I'm still doing porn five years from now, I'd be kind of surprised. But I, I saw it as like a good way to like get in the game of making adult content. And I think that there's just a lot of stuff that I could do in the adult space that I think would be cool and would make porn look cool and would be able to like you know have a real fan base and have the fans be hyped on it and stuff so like what we're doing right now is just the beginning a lot of different things that i'm planning on bringing to the table and just the idea of being able to grow this cool ass brand with my girl and just like see where we can take it is just such a a fun cool thing to me just to be able to work on this together you know to me it's very sexy to grow a business with my girl possibly because i just frame everything as like a business in my head yeah people would say you're living the dream yeah i mean but they don't know you're running a business yeah and i mean it's fun though i mean like i'm not mad at all when i gotta go to work and fuck you know some random hot chick not mad at it at all it's fun i don't i don't mind doing it you know it's like to me it's very natural and uh yeah sometimes i think about it i'm like wow what a weird business and there's so few people on earth that would even consider starting this but here i am we start we actually did this we actually started a porn fucking podcast i remember you <laughs> you told me about that shit really? during yeah. covid what, what when you, you we, i was just like that sounds nuts but you know what the fuck because i, I have a lot of weird ideas that i don't actually end up doing and I'll be super excited about it, and I'll, like, tell people for, like, a couple of days, and I'll just forget about it because I just don't end up thinking it's worth my time. I mean, I, the porn shit brings in dough, so I was just like, he knows what he's doing. That's why, like, immediately, like, think about No Jumper. Like, if you were to look at how much we were making in the early days, it was, like, less than a 1000 bucks probably for, like, you know, a long time. And then all of a sudden it starts, like, really working. It's kind of, like, more of a long-term thing building up a YouTube catalog. But with porn... Like me and my girl were talking about it in the beginning. It was like, you know, if 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 this makes a hundred grand the first month, then that's probably an L. So immediately I knew we were gonna have like a good amount of money to hire people and actually like wow. do cool shit and everything, you know. Fuck. Whereas like with no jumper, a lot of you know, it's more passion. Yeah, it's hard to like justify doing a lot of the cool shit you could do. Like we could make a documentary. We could make an amazing hour long documentary and just put it on YouTube. And totally like just lose fifty grand on <laughs> producing it, you know. Well, that's like the constant struggle. Yeah. With like trying to come through with quality content, because everyone thinks you just you put out the content, you automatically get money. That's not how it works. <laughs> yeah, YouTube money is not. It's thin. It's okay, sometimes you know if you if you really kill it or if you have sponsors consistently, it can be dope. But I'm glad that we can just like do cool shit and not really have to worry that much about it. You know. All right, where do you? Where do you see No Jumper in the next five years? Hopefully just, you know, what it is now, but just cooler, more advanced, more resources, more revenue streams, just being able to do doper shit. Like, I would really just like, I look at something like Barstool, and that's just the coolest shit in the world to me, that, like, Dave just started something to serve one niche, 
and then just fucking grew it to the point that it was just so fucking big and that so many different people have some part of the barstool ip that they fuck with you know like whether they just have one show that they watch or whether it's like josh who watches fucking 10 of them or whatever you know it's just like how far can i take this we're playing the game you know that's how i feel when when people come to me and they're like oh my god like how do you how do you feel like you fucking like like how did you do all this how did you build this i just am like what i want to say is just like i don't know bro i've been playing the game (laughs) like i'm just trying to see what i could do you know i could have stopped a long time ago and probably been able to live a pretty happy and comfortable life but you know i'm just trying to see what i can do with it well i I was watching that uh million dollars worth of game with the the barstool ceo or whatever dave right yeah dave and he was saying like the reason why they're able to build this shit is because he just lets creators do what they do and i feel like you kind of do the same thing in terms of like the shows and stuff you kind of just hey this is the platform make it what you're gonna make it and you know (laughs) you weed out the, the Bi- weaklings on the and, way out. And, and, like, build the business out as much as possible because that allows you to just invest in people. And the reason why they're able to do sick shit and, like, have people on there that probably get paid a lot of fucking money is just because they've built such a good business that that content is worth that much to them. And that's what the battle in hip-hop is going to be where you're going to have all these different, you know, companies making content who are trying to fight for – different talent and it's gonna be like okay well who's got the fucking the bag to pay for it because as it gets more uh more competitive that's probably gonna be one of the most important things you know is the bag's gonna get bigger or smaller the bag is probably just gonna keep getting bigger because i feel like to me every hour that i spend on camera making content for no jumper is now way more valuable to me than it used to be because we got the clips channel so if I do an hour-long interview, chances are there's going to be three, four, five, however many clips that I'm going to put on the clips channel. So maybe that's worth X amount of dollars extra. We're going to put the best parts on Facebook. That's going to make X amount of dollars extra. Um, I'm not currently monetized for reels and stuff, but a lot of our reels are getting like many hundreds of thousands of views. So that's like another revenue stream once they turn that on for everybody. So to me, if I'm doing a piece of content now versus – five years ago an hour-long interview and just the fact that our interviews get way more views on average now because of the fact that we've been doing this for so long or whatever and we have a bigger fan base it's like i I mean an hour on camera might be worth 10 times to me what it was worth five years ago that makes and as and and all these comp all these companies are in competition for content so you know it's it's only going to get better i would assume for the foreseeable future because there's such an appetite for this shit Man, well, I'm excited for the ride. Appreciate it. Appreciate it, Trev. Proud of you, man. Man, thank you. Free Smoke the Podcast. Like, comment, subscribe. Let's go. Let's go.